Hi there. Just need to finish this one line. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you've caught me here working on this project. News we're working on for a little later today. We're trying to catch the number of surprises, count the number of surprises of God in the Bible, in the biblical story. We're really out of control now. The number is just continues to rise. I'm not sure that we're ever going to get the real number of surprises that God has that take place. The ways that people that people are caught off guard by God, by Jesus, by what the Holy Spirit is doing. And so surprise brings joy. Surprise brings shock. Surprise brings a disruption. So come get ready for a surprise. See you in worship. The Lord be with you. Prepare the way of the Lord. We light this candle in joy. The joy that we have in Jesus our Savior.
Mighty God, we do not yet see the glory you plan for all humankind, but in faith we do see Jesus. We thank you for the humility and holiness in which he lived and died, and we praise you for the, for the fact that he freed us from our sin, that he comforts and strengthens us 
through our times of struggle and that he gives us the courage to follow him. Amen. The prayer of confession is printed in the bulletin and will also be on the screen. God of birth, God of joy, God of life, we come to you as a people hungry for good news. We have been so dead to miracles that we have missed the world's rebirth. We have preoccupied ourselves with pleasures and have overlooked the joy you offer us. We have been so concerned with making a living that we have missed the life you set among us. Forgive us, gracious God. Open our eyes and our hearts to receive your gift. Open our lips and our hands to share it with all humanity in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Take comfort in the assurance that even those things that are hidden from memory or are too deep for our words are not beyond, are not beyond God's forgiving love. God, who knows us completely, bestows upon us pardon and peace. Thanks be to God. I'm going to do the children's story from over here by this Christman tree. Not Christmas, Christman tree. Because I've been getting some questions about what on earth this tree is doing here and what these decorations on it are. These decorations are symbols that remind us of Jesus Christ. They were put together by the Sunday school kids. Not this year because it wasn't possible in COVID time, but these are from two years ago. And are different symbols that tell us about Jesus Christ. So, Christ, and then monographs, symbols. So, some of them are pretty obvious. So, we have here a star, that's pretty obvious, the star that led the wise men to Jesus. We have a crown, that Jesus is the king who has come. We have a lamb, to remind us of the shepherds cross to remind us that Jesus came and lived among us and died and rose again. And then the one I like to talk about a lot, a fish. So why on earth would we put a fish on the cross, on on the tree? Well, the fish was the early symbol, secret symbol that Christians, of Christians being Christians. So if you take in Greek the first letters of the following phrase, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Take the first letters of those, and you spell that out. That spells ichthus, which is the Greek word for fish. So it was a secret symbol that Christians used to tell each other that they were Christians. And when Debbie and I were visiting in Ephesus, we saw on the door jamb of one of the houses, a fish had been carved into the stone. So a reminder that that was a house where Christians had lived. And so this tree reminds us that Christmas is all about Jesus and points us to him coming, his coming. And so these simple symbols remind us of that. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, has come to live among us. We thank you for these symbols that tell us his story. Guide us as as your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. John the Baptist is one of those Advent characters who shows up, pronounces the way, announces the way that is coming, which announces that one greater than he is about to arrive. John is a difficult character, prophetic, loud, uncompromising, and lives a radically different lifestyle. Locusts and wild honey, camel hair clothing, is not the kind of smooth, suave kind of person you'd think of. But people came in droves to hear him and to hear his clear message. He spoke the truth. 
There is an aspect of Advent which asks us to look truthfully at our lives. To look at our lives in the way that John the Baptist would invite us to look at our lives. Where are we really? Who are we really? Are we prepared to be transformed, changed? That's what John wants to know. That's what Advent asks us. Are we prepared to be changed by this one who is coming, by the amazing news that Christ will come again? Amen. For our scripture readings, let us pray. God of grace, open our ears, still our hearts and minds, that we might hear from you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 16, reading verses 6 to 15. They, that's Paul and his fellow companions, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came opposite Missa, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Missa, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. So we set sail from Troas and took straight course to Samothrace, following the day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. 
We sat down and spoke to the women who were gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Our second reading comes from Galatians chapter 4, reading verses 1 to 7. This is Paul writing. My point is this. Heirs, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves, though they are owners of all the property, but they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the father. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when in the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so you might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the, Holy, the Spirit of his, fa- his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Here ends our scripture readings for this morning. Throughout human history, people have thought they knew better than God, or they tried to help God out. Just some examples from the Bible. Abraham and Sarah were convinced that God wasn't going to be able to keep the promise of giving them a child, and so they went to find a surrogate to get themselves a child. Gideon thought he was pretty smart when he came up with an army of 32,000 to go fight the Midianites only to discover that God didn't need 32,000, God only needed 300. Saul thought he was pretty smart when he offered to David all his armor so that David could go fight Goliath. And as it turned out, David needed none of that armor to go fight Goliath. David, by turns, thought that it was a smart thing to build a temple for God, and God said, no, you don't need to build it, someone else will. The disciples thought that they were going to help Jesus out by saying to the parents and the children, don't bring the children to Jesus. He's too busy for that. And Jesus reprimanded the the disciples for that. Peter thought he was smart when he said to Jesus, you're not going to die on the cross. That's not the plan. That's not the way. But it was. And Jesus confronted Peter with that. And that's just the biblical narrative. Over and over and over again, human beings have thought they knew better than God, and they were going to work things out for God to make sure he would bring about the stuff he needed. (coughs) In the passage we read from Galatians, it says, in the fullness of time, when the time was right, God sent Jesus. When the time was right. We often think we know the timing, we have the plan, we should implement the plan, and God should simply bless what we have done. But that's not the way God works. God in surprise again and again does God's thing in God's way, in a way that we could not even begin to imagine or conceive. Because the story here, the pattern here about how Jesus comes into the world and the plan that God uses to save us, is one that no one would design or plan or think through. That God, the maker of the universe, the one through whom everything was made, Jesus Christ, came and was born among us, lived among us, experienced human life in all of its fullness, was hungry and thirsty, told good jokes and laughed at good jokes, understood what it was to be tired and exhausted, wept with those who wept and laughed with those who laughed, who experienced all that was human, 
came and lived among us. Who would think of making a salvation operation in this way? But God was in the business of not just saving a few human beings, not just rescuing a few, but offering freedom from slavery, slavery to sin, offering us freedom from that to all of humanity, to all people. And to do that, the plan was, God's plan was, that Christ would come and live among us. Work with us, be alongside us, and from within that experience of being captured by the human reality, by the human challenge, would break free and offer us freedom as well. It's a plan that no human being would draw up. Paul, in another place, calls it foolishness, for it is. It's weakness that God would save us by dying on the cross. This foolishness and this weakness is the way that God works in the world, the way that God brings transformation and change in the world. And God continues to use the broken and the little and the unimportant and the overlooked to bring about the plans that he has and the ways that he desires. If we look at church history, in the 4th and 5th century, the leaders of the church thought they were going the right direction. They thought they had a plan to move ahead. And as it turned out, they were wrong. Instead, God used men and women who left Egypt, Christians who left Egypt, and went and lived on the edge of the desert. And there they prayed for the people of God, for the church. And they are the desert fathers and mothers who in many ways saved the church as God used them who lived a monastic life. In the 12th century, a young man walked in the middle of his town in Italy. He was about to inherit his father's large estate. But this man stripped off all of his clothes and walked out of town, leaving it all behind. And he was St. Francis of Assisi. In 1517, an unknown university professor in a two-bit university in a town in Germany that didn't matter and was unimportant took 95 theses and nailed them to the front door of the church, which was the Facebook of his day. And that was Martin Luther at the Reformation. In the 18th century, a failed pastor who had really blown it his heart strangely warmed by the Holy Spirit and began to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And because of that, got thrown out of churches because they didn't want him. Got thrown off of street corners where he ended up preaching. Ended up preaching in farmers' fields to thousands and tens of thousands who came to know Jesus Christ. And that was John Wesley. About a hundred years later, a Methodist couple with deep concern for those on Skid Row in London began a ministry to care for the drunks and the poor. That was William and Catherine Booth. And the Salvation Army was born. In 1905, in a literally half-burned-out warehouse in Los Angeles, in a church led by a black pastor, with straw on the floor to absorb the moisture that came up from the ground, from the dirt floor, the Holy Spirit fell in power. That was Azusa Street and the start of the Pentecostal movement. In our own time, in our own time, we have seen the gospel spread rapidly in Africa and Asia and Latin America so rapidly and so powerfully that now Africans and Koreans and other Asians are coming to North America to remind us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who we sent missionaries to are coming to be missionaries to us. God is in the business of doing surprise after surprise after surprise. Now, this next part of the sermon has three fingers pointing back at me, so you can listen to me talking to myself. Sadly, white Anglo-Saxon North American pastors, like myself, 
have often bought into the idea that if we had the right plan and just worked the right skills, we could make everything perfect in the church. That we by our strength and our power and our ability and our knowledge could make the church perfect. Or at least make it grow. And you can go anywhere. I realize the bookstores aren't the thing anymore, but you can go online to Christian book distributors and you can find page after page after page of people who have written books about how to save the church. And my analysis of many of them, it would be the following. I realize this is somewhat cynical, but my analysis would be that the end result of many of these plans is the following description. The cure was perfect. Unfortunately, the patient died. That's a joke. Because in God's world, human plans are not the way. God is in the business of doing surprise after surprise after surprise. The coming of Jesus Christ is not the way the world was supposed to be saved in human terms, but it was God's way. The Apostle Paul was traveling through, Greek, through Turkey on his way to try to find a new mission field. And so if you can imagine in your heads a map with Greece on this side and Turkey on this side, and he's crossing through Turkey about halfway up the country, it keeps on trying to go south into all those provinces that we heard named. And every time he tries to go south, he's blocked by the Holy Spirit. We don't know exactly how that happened, but he sensed the Holy Spirit was saying, no, that's not the way. And so he kept on heading west, he and his companions, and finally they ran out of land. They came to the coast, to Troas. Where were they supposed to go? And that night, Paul had a vision, a dream, in which a man looked like he was dressed from Macedonia, said, come help us in Macedonia, which meant crossing the Aegean Sea and going up a little bit into northern Greece. That's what Paul did and his companions. And there they walked into Philippi and met Lydia. Lydia, who also wasn't from the Philippi, was from Thyatira, was in fact from a city in Turkey. But they met in Greece, in Macedonia. And Lydia comes to faith, her and her entire household. God had a plan. A plan that was beyond Paul's understanding or goals. He had no plans to go to Greece. But God led him there. That's where he ended up. And because of Paul's willingness to let his plans be changed and shaped and formed by the God of grace, the gospel spread to Europe, spread to Philippi. We have the book of Philippians and the gospel spread. 175 years ago, on November the 30th, 1846, John and Charlotte Getty and their family and the newly married couple of the Archibalds sailed out of Halifax Harbor as the first missionaries of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. And they were on their way to the New Hebrides in the South Pacific, now called Vanuatu. When they finally got to Vanuatu, they thought they were supposed to be going to the island of Afet. That's the place they had prepared to be, and they'd learned about, and they'd read about, which is in the southern end of the Vanuatu chain of islands. When they got to the harbor in Effet, the governor came in and said, this is not a good time to be visiting here. Things are just too unstable. You shouldn't be landing. And so they decided to go to the next island south, Anetum. They had no plans to go there, but that's where God sent them. Closed the door in the one place and said, this is the place to come. And so in 1848, they finally landed on the island and began their mission. 24 years later, when the Gettys retired, the people of the island put up a monument. And the monument said, when the Gettys arrived, there were no Christians. Now when they leave, there are no non-Christians. 
They hadn't planned to go. God had acted. God had done something beyond their imagining. But isn't that the Christmas story as well? Mary and Joseph didn't have any plans to be in Bethlehem. They didn't have any plans to be the parents of the Messiah. But God did something. The wise men had no plans to take that long journey from Baghdad to Jerusalem and on to Bethlehem. But God had other plans. The shepherds had no expectations of being called to the cradle, to the side of the manger, to there see the Christ child, the Messiah, and to be the first to proclaim that good news. That wasn't their plan. Again and again and again, God breaks into our plans, into our structures, into what we think, and changes things. Our invitation is, can we hold our plans loosely enough? Can we hold our goals, our expectations, what we want loosely enough to be open to what God might do? Sometimes God will build on what we've dreamed up. Sometimes it means shelving entirely what we have thought of. But God's plan and God's way is always better, more wonderful than we could imagine. Yes, I admit it's very frustrating when God comes to your plan and says, I thought that was going to happen. Eh, That's not what's going to happen. This is going to happen instead. It's hard to take sometimes. But God knows what he's about. And in our planning and our calculating, in our dreaming and our thinking, We are invited in this Advent season to be open to what God is doing. I think particularly in this moment of COVID, we are being challenged as people, as individuals, to ask ourselves where God is leading. Having preached the sermon I've got through so far, I'm not about to tell us where that is because that would shut down the whole point of the sermon, right? No, I don't know. But can we be open to hearing where God might be calling? Can we be open to having our plans and our schemes and our calculating and our dreams reshaped by him? To live into the advent recognition that Christ will come again and that he will reshape our lives and our world for his honor and for his glory. Amen.
Let us pray. God of grace, we ask that you would come and surprise us. In this Advent season, surprise us with your presence, with the plans and the plans that you have that are beyond our imagining and that fill us with hope. Come surprise us. Help us to trust you that you can be free in our lives, to trust our lives to you. Help us to hold loosely to the plans that we have, that we might rest in you and in you alone. We come praying for our world. We pray for those who do not have electric power right now or the hydro is out. Be with them. Give them heat and comfort as they wait. Be with those who are trying to restore the power. Give them safety. We pray for those impacted by the storms in the United States, the tornadoes. We grieve with those who grieve, those who have lost loved ones. We pray for government officials as they seek to think about rebuilding. Pray the same in British Columbia in the wake of the flooding, that you would give grace and hope as the rebuild begins especially to those who have lost everything. We pray for our world. We pray especially for Haiti today, that there would be ways ahead that would bring hope to that nation. We recognize that foreigners, missionaries are being asked to leave for their safety. We pray for our Christian sisters and brothers who remain behind in Haiti, that you would give them courage, hope, and strength. Surprise us with peace in our world. Break down the plans of those who want to have war and violence so that peace might come between Russia and the Ukraine, between Taiwan and China, in Myanmar and Yemen. Bring peace, we pray, by your surprising power. We bring before you people we know. Remember those who are sick. In particular, we think of those who are at the front lines of the COVID challenge. Give them wisdom in this new wave. Give them strength to doctors and nurses and public health officials. Remember those who grieve. Surround them with your love and care and compassion. That they would know a comfort and a peace beyond understanding as you surround them in your love and care. And Lord God, we thank you for the surprises that you do bring to our lives. Surprise upon surprise that fills us with joy. Fill us with joy, we pray. As we look ahead to the surprising kingdom that you are bringing into our world. In the silence, we bring to you our thanksgivings and our requests, knowing that you hear us. Pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have some announcements to bring to your attention. 
So as we approach Christmas, I want to simply talk about some services as we come to the Christmas season. Next Sunday, the 19th, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to be having a service here called the Hope for the Holidays service. It's a service for those for whom Christmas is a difficult time because of losses in their lives, loved ones who have died, or other losses that might be impacting them, or other stressors or griefs that make Christmas difficult. A quieter service, we'll sing a few quiet Christmas carols, have some prayers, and remember to give the stresses and pains of our lives to the Christ child who loves us beyond measure. So it's next Sunday at 2 o'clock here in the sanctuary. On Christmas Eve, we're having two services, one at 7 o'clock and one at 9 o'clock. At 7 o'clock, it'll be like our Sunday morning worship services, so six feet of distancing between household bubbles. At 9 o'clock, you will need to be double vaccinated to attend the 9 o'clock service. If you plan to attend the 7 o'clock service, could you please call ahead? Because we do think that we're going to be maxing out the space we have. And so please, if you wish to come, call ahead so that you can reserve a spot. And one other announcement as we're coming out of COVID and things are shifting. As we start to see groups starting to meet in the building on a more frequent basis, could you please call the church office and make sure that the space is available at the time that you want? Some of the groups who met before COVID are beginning to meet, but are meeting at other times, different times than they had before. And so the calendar is a bit um, askew, I'll say. So please call ahead so that we can manage who's here when and still recognize the distancing that we need to be following in this COVID time. And one final announcement, you'll see the red insert about how we can support hearts during this Christmas Advent season. Let's pray for the offering. God of grace, take these gifts that we return to you. Use them for your honor and glory in this your world. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together in singing joy to the world.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, because now and forevermore. Amen.